All right, guys, usually we get right into the show, but I'm going to take just a moment to talk to you. First of all, the show is now 16 years old and counting. Thank you all for being here. A number of you have said that you would like to support the show. Well, now you can. If you've ever gotten enjoyment or inspiration from the Paul Leslie Hour, consider becoming a patron. Just go to patreon.com slash the Paul Leslie Hour. All right, let's get into the show. The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to introduce you all to Paul Brady. He's a singer, songwriter, international performing artist, a recording artist, He's from Northern Ireland and has been called a favorite songwriter of everyone from Bob Dylan to Bonnie Raitt. In my humble opinion, if I may editorialize a little bit, his music is spectacular. A number of top recording artists from Santana to Tina Turner have covered his work. Paul Brady, thank you very much for taking a few minutes and talking to us. My pleasure, Paul. Good to talk to you. Why would you say it is that you're drawn to write songs? What is it about the process that excites you? Well, firstly, I'm into it from a musical point of view because I'm a musical animal and always have been all my life. I've loved the song form since I was a child. And then when I got to an age where I had sort of reasonably grown up and felt I had something I needed to say to if nothing else, explain myself to myself, I decided uh, I'd like to try and write songs. And that started around about the late 70s. Well, actually, it's, it, had, it started before that in the very early 70s, but I kind of was a bit discouraged back then, so I, I kind of put it all on the back burner for another decade. Now, you said explain yourself to yourself. Would you say that making music for you is almost a therapeutic thing. Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say therapeutic. It certainly it gives me a, a mode to express thoughts, feelings, emotions, and uh, opinions. <laughs> is there something that you hope for the listener or someone who goes to your concerts, or someone who listens to one of your recordings, is there something you're hoping that they get from that experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, what I'd hoped they would get would be the same kind of feeling that I that m made me want to write the song in the first place. I mean, I believe that a song is fundamentally a communication. You know, a song is meaningless unless there's someone there to hear it. <laughs> and uh, I've always wanted to be a communicator particularly in live performance, I like to feel that the audience is feeling the same thing I'm feeling when I'm singing a certain song. So you would say that the live performance is more important to you than, say, the recording? Well, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm asked this question often, and I'm torn between extremes and how to answer it. I think fundamentally I'm... And I'm firstly a performer. Uh, I do a lot of solo performance, but I, I also work with a band. But I'm, you know, I'm a quite practiced solo performer, and a, and a lot of my audience, my fans, would 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 prefer me solo rather than in the band because they feel that the solo performance is the mo is the rawest connection and the and the purest connection between the performer and the audience. So I've always felt instinctively a performer, but I but I am also in love with the 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 the, the studio experience, whereby you can build up a kind of a an emotional soundtrack, which will, if you like, heighten, or the the idea would be hopefully that it would heighten the impact of the emotion already in the song by whatever kind of landscape you might set the song in a, mo a sonic landscape uh, or what you know whatever clothes you put on the song <laughs> in a way so I'm, I like both 
Is that nerve wracking? Is it? Is it a nervous experience to be just by yourself, just a solo performer on stage in front of an audience? Uh, well, paradoxically, it's not. In fact, I often feel more in control and less nervous when I'm on my own than I do in in a band situation. When I'm on my own, I know exactly what's coming next. I know exactly how to to express myself. In a band situation, you're always dependent on tech, on uh, on a lot of technology and a lot of musicians. And uh, much as I enjoy it, it's 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 certainly can can be a little nerve wracking at times. The solo performance is easier for me, and and I'm I'm I, I get nervous before a show, yeah, but, but it's a sort of a adrenaline type nervousness, you know. And if I didn't. I probably wouldn't give a good show. <laughs> do you have any kind of ritual or something you do before you take the stage? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I go into myself and I, I, I don't communicate with anybody at all apart from my crew. And I, I suppose I try and open myself uh, to let <laughs> the beast to come through, as I call it, <laughs> it's it's sort of uh, when I'm on a stage, I'm I'm larger than life. I'm something inhabits me. It's it's a gift that was given. It's a sort of a another another persona comes through me when when I get on a stage, and uh, that's who. That's what I rely on when I'm on a stage. And when the beast, as I call it, <laughs> doesn't appear, then uh, you're, uh, you want to get off the stage as, as, uh, as quick as you can. Very interesting. What is it like for you when you meet a fan, when someone comes up to you and they say, oh, Paul Brady, I, I love your music. It means so much to me. What, what, when someone says that kind of thing, what does that feel like? Well, it's great. It's 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 a thrill. Uh, you know, I'm a great believer that the song, once you write the song and it's gone, uh, that you don't you don't own it anymore. You certainly don't own the the potential emotional effect of the song. I mean, I I have written songs, uh, and that have had a very varied effect on people. Um, uh, and you know, people people go meet with a song, and if they're open to, to to letting the song work its magic, then it will affect them in a totally different way to to the next person. And uh, I mean, a, a classic example is a song of mine, "The Long Goodbye," which was written, I suppose, with with a a, a dying relationship in mind that that just wouldn't end. But but people approached me afterwards when when they heard the song and one person thought it was about someone with alzheimer's you know that it was a song about about a person who was fading away from from alzheimer's and there was another instance of when a, a couple had a a child born with a fatal uh, uh illness which meant that the child was only going to live for say a month and all the time that was happening my song was on the radio over here and the woman got in touch with me to say that it, it really helped her an awful an awful lot and uh you know the, the title being the long goodbye so i'm i'm never ceased to be amazed at people's interpretations of songs that in my head meant something entirely different and it just shows me again and again that i'm not in control of all this I'm just really some kind of a vessel to let whatever's out in the ether come through, and and it'll only come through if I let it. So if you're not in control, then who is? The cosmos, man. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, just uh, nobody's in control. I don't know. I mean, it's all a sort of a you gr you grab onto things and. And and you can just drop them and let them go, and nothing and nothing will come of them. Or you can keep at them and and 
eventually something starts to happen and suddenly you end up with, well, not suddenly, but eventually you end up with a song. Although suddenly too, I mean, I've written many songs, hundreds of songs, and a couple of my best known ones I wrote in about 20 minutes, you know. Hmm. Last night I was listening to a live recording of you and Mark Knopfler on stage. Right. Was that from my the Vicar Street album, was it? I have it here. It's got the cover of the album is like a it looks like a newspaper. It says October on the front. Yeah, the the Vicar the Vicar Street sessions. That that yeah, must it, be it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what was the song again? Uh, Baloney again? Oh, Baloney again. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Who have you shared the stage with that was the most thrilling for you? Good lord. I think it was Tina Turner. Wow. She was appearing in the mid eighty, well, the late eighties, in open air in, in Dublin, and she had just recorded my song uh, "Paradise Is Here" on her album "Break Every Rule," which was the follow-up to "Private Dancer," her her big comeback album, and uh, I was I was standing with Roger Davies, her manager, at the sound desk in this open-air gig, and he said to me, would you like to get up with Tina? And I wasn't expecting that. And I said, yeah, sure. So we went up to the, to the back, to the side of the stage, and I don't think Tina actually knew what was, hap- what was going to happen. But anyway, I got, uh, she was about to sing my song, and I found myself being <laughs> being pushed out on the stage, and I got up beside her, and she kind of said, <laughs> "Well, what are we going to do? Because we hadn't rehearsed anything." And I said, uh, "Well, I'll tell you what. You sing the first verse, I'll sing the second verse, and we'll both sing the chorus." And she sort of said, "Sure, let's do it." And that, of course, like that. I mean, the audience was very familiar with me because it's my town. And so there was a big, a big welcome when I appeared on the stage and, and the whole thing was, was a great success. It worked out perfectly and the audience loved it and Tina loved it and I loved it. And, and, uh, that was about it really, but that it was a huge thrill and mainly so because it wasn't rehearsed and I hadn't a clue what was going to happen. On the note of people performing or recording songs that you wrote, could you say that there is a best interpretation or a most interesting interpretation of a Paul Brady song that you've heard? Oh, God. (laughs) Well, I've always loved Bonnie Raitt's uh, versions of my songs. Her, Her... title track the luck of the draw of of her big grammy winning album my was my song and the way she treated it was very different to to the way i treated it on my own album huba duba she 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 had a much more i suppose very individual approach to 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 how to sing the song which was really nice to hear and uh, it it was a surprise to hear the way she did it I'm hoping you can tell us about a song of yours, The World Is What You Make It. Yeah. What got you inspired to write that? Uh, Well, I was in New York City at the time, around about the early 90s. I had just finished an album there, mixing an album. It was called Trick or Treat. And I went to boarding school as a child and, and studied Latin. And for some reason, my mind <laughs> took me back to being in in the Latin class and learning about about Hannibal crossing the Alps, uh, the Carthaginian general, and with with elephants and coming to to try and beat the Roman Empire in war. And uh, at the same time, I suppose I was <laughs> realizing that. 
a lot of what I was about was trying to make things happen out of nothing. I didn't really have a real job, so nobody was telling me what to do. So if I wanted to invent myself or, or if I wanted to get any progress in my life or career, I had to invent it myself. And the concept of that, of human beings doing that to to make sense of their lives and get ahead was something that appealed to me. And I just thought I'd use a few examples from history <laughs> about people who who sort of uh, did did the grand gesture and wrote themselves into history. <laughs> hmm. So is literature a big influence? Does it, is it something that inspires you regularly? Well, yeah, I like to read. You know, I like to read all the time. I like literature. I like words. I like poetry. I like the theater. I like the way – I like – expression via, via the word and music and uh i've always been attracted to to writers i suppose who shared that same kind of love of 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 the written word you know a moment ago we were talking about that song the world is what you make it on your website i think this is from the twitter feed there's a picture it says heading to london with jimmy buffett and there's a picture of the two of you together. It was in Atlanta he was performing that song. I'm curious, do you know how Jimmy Buffett became acquainted with that? Um, well, yeah. Uh, you mentioned Mark Knopfler earlier. It was actually through Mark Knopfler. Jimmy and Mark. Mark Knopfler, you may know, already had a, written a song for Jimmy called, I think it's called The Oldest Surfer on the Beach. Yes. And so therefore, Mark and Jimmy Buffett were, were friends, you know, and Jimmy, when he knew he was coming to uh, Ireland and to England, got in touch with Mark. And in the course of the conversation, he was asking Mark, you know, who, who did he who who did he admire over in this part of the world and uh, and any did he know anybody in Ireland because Jimmy was going to be there and Mark mentioned my name straight away because I've known Mark since the er since back in the early 80s 1981 and we've worked together many times and uh we're good friends ever since so Jimmy started listening to my stuff then uh this would be around about last April or May and he picked out the world is what you make it and uh, started doing it with his band. And then he kind of went deeper into my catalog and pulled out a few other songs. So he's planning to make another album next January, which will, I mean, he's thinking of, of including another couple of songs of mine on this album. So he seems to have, you know, liked what he heard. And uh, when he came to Ireland, he asked me to, to get up and play with him, you know. And then I went to London with him. But unfortunately, Mark was already, was in the States at the time on, on a tour. This is like about 10 days ago. So we didn't get to hook up the three of us, but but uh, I spent some really nice time with Jimmy over, the week, over that weekend. What would you say is the best compliment you've received <laughs> I don't tend to remember compl compliments to be honest there's nothing jumping out of my head I can't answer that question <laughs> would you call yourself a humble man mm. wouldn't go that far <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'm I never expect to get noticed and I'm always pleasantly surprised when I am. Interesting. Would you say that for an artist, it's more important to be confident, or is it more important to have humility? Oh, I don't think humility is necessarily is a necessary part of of the uh, artist's arsenal. <laughs> you know, humility comes further down the line, but if you're too humble at the beginning of something, you might never finish it, you know? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. 
you have to have a bit of arrogance about you to do anything in this world. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What is in the future? What's coming down the river for Paul Brady? Well, if if you happen to know, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Any- I, I have I haven't a clue. Uh, I may go out with uh, I, I may go out to the states in January and do a little work with Jimmy on, on this album he's making. That's if uh, he still intends to do it. I mean. I'm I'm a great believer in, you know, the the old adage, which probably is not as relevant these days since nobody buys records anymore. But the old adage for the songwriter was, you, know, you never believe your song's actually on the record till you go into the shop and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> because even up to the last minute, through the mastering process, I've 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 lost songs on records, you know. I've heard so many writers, so many singer-songwriters who have told me these horrible stories where they actually see this huge star they've admired their whole life sing the song, and then for whatever reason, it does not appear on the album. It's not chosen or whatever. I mean, disappointment, of course, is a part of life, but anyone who pursues something so, uh, something like music, there's going to be disappointment. What have you done? What do you do when you're facing disappointment? Uh, I try and involve myself in something new, some new work, and uh, and just get over it, you know, and move on. I mean, I've had more success than than most people deserve. You know, <laughs> I'm a lucky, lucky man. The one thing I, I I I will agree on is that humans are very strange creatures, and <laughs> you never can quite get enough, you know. And and whenever you whenever you climb a certain mountain and you're and you're sitting on the top of it, looking around, you immediately take take for granted what's just happened, and and you look around and see the taller mountain across the valley, you know. <laughs> Um, so humans are hard to satisfy. You were saying a moment ago that you're a lucky, lucky man. On that note, what is the best thing about being Paul Brady? Oh, dear. Um, the best thing about Paul Brady is that I've managed to... Create a lot of stuff and be acknowledged for it and to have made a good living without ever having fallen into the 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 hands of paparazzi. <laughs> I am I'm delighted that I, I never became globally famous, and that I was able to I'm able to live my own life and 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 with my family uh, pretty much out of the public eye and the spotlight, and uh, yet at the same time achieve a lot of satisfaction from the work that I've done. But you say you, you've never wanted to be famous. Uh, well, I didn't actually say that. I mean, there. <laughs> when I was starting off, I mean, you realize that success and fame – are this one package, you know, and that you can't seem you can't seem to think of the possibility of having success without being famous too. So therefore, the you want to be famous, but only as a tool, or as a as a tool to be successful. And I don't necessarily mean financially. I mean just to feel good about your time in the world and and that you somehow deserve to be here. That's what I call success. So in my earlier years, I might have thought that the only way to achieve that was to be famous. And for large parts of the 80s and 90s, I suppose, I struggled with the fact that that wasn't happening. But as the 90s reached their second half, I began to realize that actually I 
where I was was where I really wanted to be. And um, I didn't feel the need to be famous any longer. I always like to give the guest the stage. There's going to be people listening from all over the world. And it's not just limited to music, but what would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Um, that I hope that music gives them the pleasure that it gives me and and fills their life with <laughs> a goodie bag <laughs> of really nice experiences. You know, music... Music is, has always been my best friend, and uh, I've always felt it was a place to retreat to when, when the world <laughs> appeared too much. So I just hope that other people manage to get the same kind of support from music that I that that, that I've had all my life. Hmm. I mean, that's that's a difficult question to be honest. <laughs> yeah, and if you ask me. Five minutes from now, I might give you a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone out there, if you want to find out more, it's paulbrady.com, paulbrady.com. My last question, I'll admit, it's another difficult one. Who is Paul Brady? Who would you say you are at heart? God. Uh, well... What am I? I don't know. I'm an ordinary man, a family man, an Irish man who, who was given the gift of music and enough balls to make a career out of it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a family man too, and the older I get, the more, the more I think that family is the only thing worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> family is the only thing worth a damn. And uh, but then again, of course, you see, I've I've written two hundred and fifty, three hundred songs. So, like I said before, I immediately take that for granted, <laughs> and it's no big deal anymore. <laughs> well, Paul Brady, thank you very much for making the time. I appreciate you talking. All right. Well, I can't I can't claim that everything I said made a lot of sense, but anyway. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. It was fun talking to you. It was fun. And I guess we have impeccable timing because we said a half hour, and here on the eastern coast of U.S., it's 10.59. <laughs> <So. laughs> All right. Well, thank you for making the time, too. And who, kn who knows, we might cross paths at some stage in the future. I hope so. Yes, let me know if you're ever in the southeast. And thanks to John also. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right. Godspeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, before we go, if you've ever gotten enjoyment or inspiration from one of the Paul Leslie Hour interviews, consider becoming a patron. Just go to patreon.com slash the Paul Leslie Hour. Thanks so much. Ba-ba doodly beep ba ba dee da dee ba ba dee boo ra ba dee ka la za jee Goodbye.